Hi there. Today we're talking about the ovulatory phase of our feminine rhythm. After today's video, you'll know what this phase of our menstrual cycle looks like, the predominating hormones and how they affect us, the problems that we can commonly face with this phase of our, our cycle, and then how we can nutritionally support ourselves within this phase. This is just one video in a series uh, called Feminine Rhythms that talks about our entire menstrual cycle as women. If you'd like, you can hit the subscribe bell and you'll be notified when the next video comes out next week, which is the last one. And you can also look in the description below for the playlist of all of the videos if you're watching this in the future. To start, our ovulatory phase is when we ovulate. So as you probably know, this is when we release our egg. Last week we talked about the follicular phase and developing this egg. Now we're gonna be talking about releasing it. And so this is a period of time that'll be about two to three days long at most. Usually it's about one to two. And then we'll, we'll jump down to my desktop so we can look at the hormones. So let's go. So as you can see, our normal hormone levels for the ovulatory phase look a little different than the other phases. It's definitely not quite so um, mellow. This is actually a very sharp spike of estrogen. We also have um, not as sharp, but a higher spike in testosterone. We also are starting to have a significant increase in progesterone production. And as I talked about last week, that is in part due because we have this egg developed and the egg is actually part of what produces progesterone. And so this time we have a few other hormones here that don't show up on this chart that I'll talk about. And that's FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone and LH, luteinizing hormone. FSH comes to a peak at this point and the estrogen being so high stops the FSH from being produced from our um, hypothalamus and pituitary glands. And so the stopping of the production of follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, means that we're not developing that, that egg anymore. We don't need to, it's already fully mature. And that cues our body into producing LH, luteinizing hormone. So some women have used LH strips. At this point, it spikes at about the same time as the estrogen spike here. So luteinizing hormone and estrogen are in synchronous, um, synchronous, sorry, in synchronicity. And so they, they happen at the same time as so the luteinizing hormone is what causes our egg to kind of actually like burst. It's like a little, um, a little finger that develops on our ovary and then it kind of pops and uh, goes into our fallopian tube for fertilization. So I wanna talk a little bit about the effects of some of these hormones, them spiking and what that can look like in our daily life. So the hormones that we just talked about are going to, at this time, it's just a few days long, going to look a little different. So as I had mentioned, working up to having a longer run, we're gonna have very high estrogen levels during this time. So that means we're going to be able to recover very quickly. We are going to be able to lift things. We're going to be able to physically perform optimally. So if there is a time where you are training, this is the time to do those longer runs that maybe even are beyond what you've been working up to in the follicular phase. So this would be the stretch run or if you are um, doing something like weightlifting, this is the time where we have a lot of estrogen. Estrogen for us can help us feel strong, sexy, lean, uh, all of those things. And so because of that, it is a good time where it can also, because we have higher progesterone levels, um, we might not necessarily recover quite as quickly because progesterone um, doesn't have antioxidant effects. It can actually kind of have a little bit of the reverse effects, but having higher testosterone, higher estrogen, all of that can help us feel stronger and have our, our body be able to perform a little bit more. Um, but we'll talk about uh, the next phase because we don't want to do this for too long, of course, but this is really the peak of that uh, physical performance. So as I mentioned, ideally this phase is about 24 to 48 hours long. It's very short, but we also are starting to develop our uterine lining. And that's going to be in preparation for if we were to get pregnant, because that's how our body is, is intending for us to, to have happen in the next uh, few days of this cycle, um, sorry, this phase, that is going to be in preparation for embryo um, attachment. So if the embryo is fertilized in the fallopian tube, at them we'll nestle into our uterine lining. So these are things that we wanna keep in mind because 
we we do have higher estrogen levels here we have higher progesterone levels we have higher testosterone levels and because of that our liver is going to have to start to break some of those down if they are too high in other phases as well so now i want to talk a little bit about some of the common problems that women can face within this this phase of their menstrual cycle in our ovulatory phase we can have a variety of different problems some of which um, are caused by not ovulating, some of which are caused by hormonal imbalances. And I wanna bring up a common um, kind of syndrome that women can possibly have. It's called polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, it means that generally they might have some types of cysts on their ovaries, but it doesn't have to mean that. Some women have PCOS, which is the abbreviation for it without having any cysts on their ovaries. But we'll talk a little bit about that and what that can um, look like in a little bit. But I wanna start with the first and major issue being not ovulating. So what does that look like? That might, necessarily, might not necessarily mean that you know you've ovulated or not. It could kind of be a mystery if you don't know how to predict your ovulation. And as I mentioned, I teach people how to do that in my Feminine Rhythms course, which will be coming out in April of 2021. So if you wanna know how to do that, keep your eye out for how to be able to, to predict that so you know if you're ovulating or you're not. Because that really is important for some of the downstream effects. And one of these is, like I had mentioned, not developing an egg and ovulation. So that means Someone might not be able to get pregnant. That for some women is very difficult because if they really wanna be a mother, that is an issue that, that doesn't have to be there um, for some women, but you really need to talk with your doctor about some of the hormone imbalances that might be going on if that's the case. So you can get a clear picture of what's going on to see if it's something that can be um, managed, can be brought back into balance and what might be going on in your body and other areas that's resulting in this as well. And now the next issue that some women can have is overgrowth of hair. And that could be because of um, them not producing enough um, an egg actually from anovulation. They can also have excess weight gain and um, acne, oily skin. So some of those things are also symptoms of PCOS, as I had mentioned. So that really can be partly because they aren't having some of the hormone spikes that we would expect during this time. Maybe their, their progesterone level is not increasing. Maybe their estrogen level isn't peaking. Maybe their testosterone level is too high. So there's, there's not necessarily the peak that we're looking for, um, as I had mentioned. And so some of these, I'll talk about why those levels might not necessarily be a um, in balance and on rhythm as we would expect. But another really big issue with the ovulatory phase is not getting pregnant or miscarrying. And so we might not necessarily have produced an egg as I had mentioned in the last video that has optimal DNA. And because of that, if we do get pregnant, we might miscarry because that egg didn't develop properly. But most of the time it is a struggle of not knowing when you're ovulating and if you do know that you are ovulating whether the egg that's being produced is um is viable so those are really the main issues and now we'll talk a little bit about those hormone levels and some of those other symptoms that people might be seeing if we don't have enough estrogen that's being produced during this time so as you had you saw we have a a spike in estrogen if the estrogen is too low then we're not going to have a reach high enough for our other glands in our body to be able to know that we need to release that egg so we might have developed an egg to partial maturity and this could be part of what's contributing to anovulation so if we're not producing enough estrogen from our body maybe we have ovaries that aren't producing enough estrogen in our body to develop an egg fully that could be part of the issue but that is really going to be one of the leading causes of anovulation next is too little fsh and that's follicle stimulating hormone that's the hormone that was developing that egg and if we don't have enough of that hormone from um, our pituitary gland then that is going to mean that we don't have that egg developed to maturity and again that can result in look like anovulation so someone might not see that they're ovulating they might not necessarily um, be able to get pregnant so that's how that would look in your body if that was was an option or not an option but what was going on the third hormonal disruption is too little 
LH, that's luteinizing hormone. So even if we are producing LH, um, we are producing estrogen. It's signaling the LH to be produced. If our pituitary gland doesn't produce enough of the luteinizing hormone for various reasons, um, then that can also contribute to us not releasing the egg. It might have matured, it might have developed well enough, but it being released from the ovary into the fallopian tube can be part of the issue there. And so it probably would um, not uh, then be available for fertilization. So even though you have a viable egg, it developed well, it isn't in the place where it can be fertilized. So that's really the struggle there. Now, last, I want to talk about um, that testosterone level. And we haven't really talked about the testosterone level previously, but one of the things that it can contribute to is our um, body knowing when to ovulate. And if we are under a lot of stress, we not only produce um, testosterone from certain glands in our body that are reproductively located, but we also produce them from our adrenal glands. If we're under stress or if we have certain chronic illnesses, sometimes the overproduction of testosterone from our adrenal glands could be contributing to someone not ovulating. So we have high testosterone levels, and that is something that is produced because it is an antioxidant. Um, it also can help buffer our immune system. So for women who have um, autoimmune illnesses, some of them struggle to get and stay pregnant because they have high um, testosterone levels, and it might not mean that they can carry um, a pregnancy full term. Uh, it might mean that they struggle with, as I'm mentioning here, ovulation, but some of those things could be, could be factors if we have high stress levels, if we're very anxious and we're not finding ways to uh, be able to break that anxiety cycle that we're in and we're constantly in the, the flight or, or fight state of our immune system, then that can also affect our ovulation, whether we ovulate. And we can see this, how some women, when they get very, very stressed, they actually stop menstruating. Um, so that can happen, um, or if they get very low body weight, because we have low fat, which helps produce estrogen. How I, as I have mentioned, it stores estrogen. And if we get very low in body fat as women, we have a predominant um, testosterone production possibly because of the stress that our body's under to maintain that low level of body fat. And those can contribute to anovulation. Next, let's talk about how we can support ourselves nutritionally with lifestyle and our mood during this phase. So I wanna start with talking about nutrient needs. Now the peak in estrogen, and as we're starting to develop progesterone, those are going to signal for our body to start developing a thicker uterine lining. That means we're going to have blood production that's, that's going to be needed. We're gonna need a few nutrients in order for that blood production to be um, optimal. So that's going to be things like vitamin K, and iron. Vitamin K we get through dark leafy greens. I'll be talking about that all month. Um, so dark leafy greens are really great for vitamin K. Vitamin K helps with blood clotting, um, which is a positive thing for most people. If someone has a blood clotting issue, this might not necessarily be right for them. They need to talk with their doctor about it. But foods such as spinach, such as um, chard and collards and, and those type of foods are going to be rich in a vitamin K so that they make sure that they, that, so that we make sure we have enough nutrients for our body to properly clot our blood. Um, we also need iron. Some women who have heavy bleeding can suffer from anemia and we are preparing uh, as we're, we're gonna be talking about next week for going into the menstrual cycle. And so at this time, we also are starting to, to have that happen because we're developing our uterine lining, which means we at this point are going to need more of that iron for the hemoglobin that's going to produce in the, the lining of our uterus. So keeping that in mind, iron can be found in things like beans and lentils, potatoes, um, things like nuts and cashews, specifically tofu, and um, probably most people's favorite, dark chocolate. So all of those are sources of iron and how we can make sure that we're supporting ourselves with a diverse um, diet so that we have these nutrients when our body is going to need them. Lifestyle and mood wise, this is our summertime. So this is the period where we are most outward facing. We're going to have a lot of focus and clarity. Um, we're gonna be able to push ourselves a little bit further in exercise. So this is a time where if we have projects that might be due later in the month, this is a great time to try and get them done um, or work 
as much as we can on them because we have the energy, we have the capacity to be able to do that and get things done without feeling as fatigued as we might feel in the next few weeks. So this is the summertime time of production. Like I had mentioned, outward facing, planning, focus, all of that. Um, and, and being in rhythm with our life, this is really a time where if we have things later, we can set ourselves up well by taking care of them in a time where we have the focus, we have the attention and the energy so that later we don't burn ourselves out by planning for those things to be done in a time where we're not um, feeling optimal, where we really should be retreating inwards. First, sesame seeds are part of um, this half's seed cycling and they contain zinc, kind of like pumpkin seeds, but they're going to be in a different combination. So the zinc in the sesame seeds is going to help with progesterone production and producing that progesterone um, and it also is going to have lignans, kind of like the flax seeds had, that are a protein that's going to help block estrogen production. So as I had mentioned, we're coming to the end of our estrogen production. It's going to fall short, fall sharply off. So we really want that to stop after ovulation. And so that is, is a point where after day 14, our first cycle, we do switch seeds. And so it's going to block estrogen production. And that can be helpful for those of us who might be struggling with higher estrogen levels, too high estrogen levels, or estrogen dominance. So those are things to consider. Sunflower seeds have both vitamin E and selenium. And vitamin E can help support progesterone production. So we're gonna be talking about this in, in the next phase is when most of our estrogen is going to be produced. So keeping that in mind, we are starting progesterone production in the ovulatory phase. So making sure we have enough vitamin E for that. Um, and then it also has selenium, which is going to not only help boost progesterone production, but it's also going to encourage our liver to detoxify excess estrogen. As I mentioned, estrogen is um, bound in our fat if there's too much of it in our bloodstream so making sure that our liver can detoxify that um, so that it doesn't get stored in excess fat because i did mention that some symptoms of this this phase not going quite properly is that we can have excess weight gain and that can be associated with possibly having estrogen dominance having too much estrogen in general and so encouraging that pathway in our liver that's going to help our body remove estrogen naturally can help make sure that we have as we move to the next phase, the right hormones in the right levels so that we have progesterone um, predominating in the next phase, which will, will help us um, feel a little bit different than we feel in this ovulatory phase. So th there you have it. Now you know a little bit more about the ovulatory phase, how the, the common uh, hormones in this phase look, what it normally should look like, common issues, and how we can nutritionally and, and support ourselves with also lifestyle habits during this phase in order to set ourselves up for success in the next phase. So I really hope that this is helpful and will be able to help you plan your month a little bit better. And if you're looking for any more detailed help, as I mentioned in the description, there'll be some course information about my Feminine Rhythms course that will be out in April that will have even more details than this all compiled for you. So I'm looking forward to it. And until next time, be well.